Hey friends, it's Mal. Welcome back to my channel. I'm so excited to document another electional astrology video for y'all. Um, I know there's like a niche of, <laughs> of people who like these videos and I like making them because uh, they help me reflect on my elections. And if you don't know what electional astrology is, um, you may be interested in learning about it, but if you don't want to be a nutcase, maybe skip it. <laughs> but really, electional astrology really is, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, ve it's very good if you are, it, you'll be really great at it if you're obsessive and <laughs> anxious and very detail-oriented you have that personality trait, you might just be a natural at electional astrology. Okay. So if you've watched these videos before, you know that um, I have no formal training in electional astrology other than three resources that Chris Brennan and the astrology podcast have put out in the past. I'll link one of those videos down below if you want to learn the basics of electional astrology. This is definitely not a like learn the basics video. I'm more gearing this video towards other more advanced students of electional astrology who will kind of uh, already get the language that I'm speaking. And uh, if you are looking to do more elections, maybe this video will help you kind of decide how to cast a chart or some things to start looking for when you are yeah, casting your own electional charts. So I've got a juicy video for you today because we are going to talk about my dun dun um, that was my best uh, Phantom of the Opera impression. Um, we're going to be talking about my Mercury retrograde election. Okay, so buckle up and let's look into this uh, class. And was it a disaster? Let's find out. Okay, so this is my Mercury retrograde election chart from this past summer. As you can see, this was a uh, called HSP summer class. I'll explain that in a moment. And we started, or I decided to have us start at 11 a.m. Central Time on June 13th, 2021. This was a Sunday. And uh, what is HSP summer class? Well, this, um, uh, maybe for the past couple of years, I've been really uh, kind of obsessed with this book called The Highly Sensitive Person by Elaine Aaron. And I started doing like these pop-up support groups for highly sensitive people. Um, and I even made a few podcasts about the highly sensitive person what is the highly sensitive person? Uh, Elaine Aaron defines us as like about 15 to 20% of the population who has a um, sort of heightened, uh, heightened sensitive, heightened sensitivity with the nervous system. So this kind of creates an experience of life for highly sensitive people where we are highly sensitive to our surroundings, right? So noises um, are louder, energies are more potent. <laughs> um, I feel like highly sensitive people can really pick up on like subtle nuances than, that the average person maybe would not think to notice. Highly sensitive people are very detail oriented, not necessarily in the way where we're good at making Excel spreadsheets or something like that. But we're detail oriented in the sense of um, we pick up on other people's social cues that again, the average person might miss. Um, and I just, as a highly sensitive person, I just feel like 
there's something um, about the energy of a person or a room or even myself that affects me more deeply than a lot of the people I know around me, right? So I loved this book. It obviously changed my life in a lot of ways. It really helped me evolve the ways I was taking care of myself and tending to my nervous system. And it also just helped me approach life from a completely new way where I was no longer um, living my, I, I'm no longer living my life in the sense of um, feeling like this world is too much for me, or I feel like that's kind of a, a highly sensitive person thing, like, oh, I'm an alien, I don't belong here, uh, like kind of to have a defeatist attitude about this world, which is fair, okay, not saying that's not valid, <laughs> uh, but I think this book has helped me kind of see that, um, you know, as a highly sensitive person, I can be here and I have a purpose in my traits and I can care for my traits in different ways so I am not filled with suffering if <laughs> if you will okay so that's the gist of this book and that's sort of how the class was formed I from these little pop-up highly sensitive people support groups uh, that I was doing for about a year. I was like, holy shit, this is really powerful to get a group of highly sensitive people on Zoom, all sharing about our experiences when it comes to nervous system, stimulation, relationships, self-care, inner child healing, all of that stuff. Um, and I was like, holy shit, this is really powerful it would actually be even more powerful if um, I formed like a cohort and we met every single week and developed a relationship with one another. So almost creating a true support group and a true like interconnected secure system for a small group of highly sensitive people to feel supported in doing certain um really difficult things like inner child work and um, examining our, our trauma from a new light and really taking a deep look at our um, inner world and noticing how, um, yeah, how, how our inner world needs care and needs the inner parent, if you will. Okay, so um, I got the class together, right? We had about 15 of us, I think, including me. Yeah, I think there's 14 and plus me, there's a group of 15 highly sensitive people, just about around that number. It might have been a little bit less, but um, I was looking for an election and I really wanted to make this a summer course. So I wanted us to meet for a kind of a long time. And we did, we met once a week for about two and a half months. So we were doing this whole summer project of internal reflection together okay um and i was like at first when i was electing when i was looking for an election i kind of realized i wasn't going to be able to begin the class at the beginning of the summer without Mercury retrograde in the mix. <laughs> so um, this was kind of a, an electional astrologer moment where I had to make a decision and sort of decide, you know, how do I, how am I going to place this Mercury retrograde in my election? Uh, optimally, we would place Mercury retrograde in uh, somewhere in the chart where it wouldn't be highlighted. But as you can see <laughs> in my election, uh, I actually, I kind of had this mentality, I guess, where it was sort of like, well, can't beat them, let's join them. <laughs> so instead of figuring out a way to um and granted I want to note that I did try to figure out a way to place mercury retrograde 
somewhere where it was not highlighted. And whenever I did that, it just didn't feel right. And the moon wasn't in a good sign. And the sun is there anyways. And then the sun's always going to be with Mercury retrograde. And if you know anything about electional astrology, you know the moon and the sun tend to be really important, as well as the ruler of the ascendant. So, you know, over time, I just kind of came into this thing. I was like, well, if I can't beat them, let's join them and let's actually highlight Mercury retrograde and see what happens. And um, shout out to some other Chicago astrologer friends, Jeanette and Drew. They both looked at this election for me and they were like, they both were like, yeah, go for it, do it. I don't feel like this is a deal breaker. So they really um, kind of confirmed my intuition on this. And here's what I was thinking. Because of the topic of the class, highly sensitive person summer camp, um, and because of what we were going to be doing, which was um, sort of a, a hybrid of a little bit of a course based off of this book, that was taught by me, but also I would say the the foundation of this summer camp was a, a more like group therapy context. And there was a lot of healing conversation and that's what I wanted the class to be. I wanted it to be a foundation of um, our relationship between our classmates and our peers. like that to be really solid so it could allow for really healing conversation to take place in this group. And that was actually my priority. So you might even start thinking, okay, Mal, so you're extra nuts because if you're trying to center converse healing conversation in this class, why, why are you still placing Mercury retrograde as the ruler of the ascendant of this chart? Well, here's the thing. I think Mercury retrograde can sometimes take us back to the past in some really powerful ways. And to be honest, that's actually kind of what ended up happening in the class. We started to dial way back, um, you know, in our own individual selves. And we started to do a lot of inner child work. And we started to reflect on our childhoods and how we were conditioned to uh, sort of uh, think about our sensitivities. A lot of highly sensitive people are kind of conditioned to think that there's something wrong with them. Sometimes because adults, teachers, parents literally say, what is wrong with you? you're so sensitive, stop being too sensitive. All of those things can kind of cause like a buildup of these like micro traumas that um, turn into something bigger as we get older. And I think all of those things sort of create a very disempowered, highly sensitive adult. And um, it's very easy for highly sensitive adults to continue to operate from the place of the wounded child. And I guess we could say this about everybody, highly sensitive person or not, but especially highly sensitive people, we tend to have very visceral somatic memories and we tend to um, really hold on to things because I find that our energetics is kind of like porous and spongy. So I think there's a part of us that tends to really hold on to a lot of the past. So to be honest, this Mercury retrograde as the ruler of the ascendant of this class ended up being so powerful, such a powerful tool for all of us to dial back to our the psyche and the experiences of the childhood and really examine our relationships with our parents, our attachments and all, all of that, all of that kind of stuff. So I felt like Mercury retrograde, ultimately, it didn't make the communication of the class bad, at least from my perspective, it wasn't a negative thing when it came to us communicating together. What it did was it kind of geared our conversations towards the past, but it ended up being in a very healing way. And remember at some point, Mercury would have stationed direct during our class time. 
And I think that's also something that is kind of cool to think about. Like, even though we started during a Mercury retrograde, um, at some point, yeah, the the we Mercury stationed direct and would have sort of uh, gone over this the point, the 18 degrees Gemini um, that we started with. So it's interesting to think about that as well. So I would say the communication issues that we did have in class, I wouldn't even have called them issues, but we were really trying to navigate as a group and I was trying to navigate as a facilitator how exactly to create this safe space so healing could happen. But if you've ever facilitated more of like a group therapy kind of vibe, you know that sometimes, um, you know, I call it, there, there's a line between emotional dumping and vulnerable sharing, you know, so I guess that was what the group was trying to figure out this whole time. What is vulnerable sharing? What is emotional dumping? How do we veer on the end of vulnerable sharing and how do we stay away from emotional dumping as a group? Because quite honestly, highly sensitive people don't need that. <laughs> you know, we're already we're already carrying a lot of energy that is not our own, and um, and yeah, and that was actually my fear as the teacher, and I I was fearing that we uh, because of my inexperience as a facilitator. This was my first time facilitating something like this. Um, and just because of the nature of the topics of the class, I actually was fearful that um, me and maybe some of the students were going to exit our time, our weekly time together and sort of be like, oh man, that was fucking draining. Like, oh, and that, that was my fear. I did not want us to leave the course feeling drained. And for that to happen, we all as a group had to figure out like how to kind of not become the masters of vulnerable sharing, but sort of we were really trying to figure out, I think, internally as individuals, what do I share? What do I um, speak to? Uh, how do I be real and legit and authentic? But how do I also keep um, yeah, keep my own energy in control. And I think we did such a good job. And I told them that by the end of the class, I was like, guys, like, I really didn't leave this class one time feeling energetically drained. I don't know about y'all. But for me, I always left these classes feeling lifted up. And I felt like my cup was filled. And it was such a beautiful feeling. And, um, you know, as a highly sensitive person, there's so many social interactions that I leave feeling like I just shouldn't have gone. You know, I just I shouldn't have even gone because it was so draining. It was almost more work to go. And now I'm even more drained. And this just became such an uplifting social interaction, at least for me, I can't entirely speak for the students, but from what, from the vibe, I felt like most, the vast majority of the class felt like this. Now, that's kind of my explanation of the Mercury retrograde in this course. Let's talk about some really good things that were happening in this chart though. Um, and one of the things I managed to make happen was uh, the moon in domicile at 28 degrees cancer. I also have my personal ascendant at 26 degrees cancer. If you can't tell by my baby face, <laughs> I am. I am a cancer rising. So uh, that was kind of cool. I could get the moon conjunct my ascendant. And, um, you know, this was, this was also a huge selling point for this chart. The fact that the moon is um, co-present with Venus in Cancer. They're both kind of really happy in the 11th house. It was just, it was good vibes all around. Um, now we can, we could make an argument that the moon is the next aspect the moon will make 
is sort of the moon going into the conjunction with Mars once they ingress into Leo, right? In just a couple hours later that day. And also the moon was just coming out of an opposition with Pluto. So how did that show up in the class? Well, it definitely showed up in the class. I'm not gonna lie. I think, I think we definitely were moving through a lot of emotional intensity uh, within ourselves. And these are the things that come up when you really start to examine how your inner child is still operating in your everyday life. And there were, there were a lot of tears in this class, <laughs> you know, I'm not like, and on my end too, like, and they weren't bad. It wasn't bad tears. It was, um, it was catharsis. There was a lot of catharsis within this class, um, you know, I think a lot of us, including me, were triggered in some very, uh, in a great way. And I think that's what we kind of have to remember. There is a bad type of being triggered. But also when we embark on really deep healing, we have to be willing to trigger ourselves in some way and kind of recover from that trigger. So that's how I'm kind of seeing that moon approaching the conjunction with Mars and just exiting that opposition with Pluto. Was there emotional intensity? Absolutely. Was it bad? No, it was very, very powerful emotional intensity that I think helped us transform as a group. Um, so that was kind of my feelings about the moon and Venus in the 11th house. And, you know, something I really love about this chart is that uh, Jupiter is conjunct the descendant. So, you know, just right off the bat, I feel like this group just clicked. Um, if you're a facilitator or a teacher, you know that, you know, you always want a class that everybody feels close and you feel like you're a good group. And, you know, even thinking back to elementary and middle school and high school, the classes that I enjoyed the most were with the teachers that sort of um, cultivated a, a little bit of like a family dynamic within our class, right? And, you know, it felt like we were all friends or buds, or we had like a special bond or connection when we went to class. And, you know, that's, those are some moments of, of school that I look back on and I really uh, sort of um, cherish. So I, I do feel like that feeling of us being like a family or like us being kind of close right off the bat or really, getting each other and I think liking each other and kind of being close as a group, I think came so naturally with this Jupiter on the descendant of this chart. It was just like, it was awesome. And it took a lot of pressure off of me because I didn't even feel like I had to do <laughs> any like team building or like, <laughs> like it just, it just happened. Like our team just fell into place. And to be honest with you, I don't, it's not to say, I don't know if this will ever happen again in one of my classes, but because uh, I, I think it will, but you know, I don't know if I'll ever have a class that was like as close as we were <laughs> in highly sensitive person summer camp. And I think that's, yes, Jupiter on the descendant, but also um, that moon Pluto and the moon opposing Mars. Like we were sh showing our ass <laughs> asses to each other in a way. Like we, I was actually showing up very unhealed and vulnerable. And I feel like as the teacher, I had to show up in a way like that because in no way did I want to ever show up as the, the master guru of the highly sensitive person, I wanted to make sure the class knew that I struggle with all of the highly sensitive person things like today, like on the daily. And um, I think in that, in me kind of uh, trying to show up as sort of unhealed and vulnerable as possible, I think hopefully it allowed everybody else to show up like that as well. So 
I don't know if we'll, I'll ever get a, a, an election this good for a class again, to be honest, like that Jupiter on the descendant was just too good. And to top it all off, my natal moon is at one degrees Pisces. So my natal moon is conjunct that Jupiter descendant conjunction. So it, it really could not have been better. Surprisingly, you know, going into the seventh house being about relationships and partnerships, that's what kind of shocked me about this election, how it worked out. Yeah, we could see the closeness of the group, but also as individuals, a lot of us were doing some um, relationship healing with our own partners or um, just within ourselves. Uh, yeah. Personally, I, I was I was actually doing a ton of relationship healing it, it within my own self in this class, and I did see other students doing that too. And I think that came along with all of the inner child work and self parenting that we were trying attempting to do together. So those relationship themes like really came in, and oh my god. This is so funny. Um, so one of my students, I don't think they would mind me sharing this. Um, they missed one of the classes because they were getting married. <laughs> and uh, it was very nice of them because they they posted the the live. They had a live video of their wedding and they posted it into our group and they invited our our class to attend the live video wedding if we wanted to and um it was it was so isn't that so funny that a wedding kind of happened within this uh within this group and another one of the students was i think uh shopping sort of for a condo with her partner and um you know there was a, there was other relationship stuff coming up and this ended up kind of being a good class for healing relationship problems and that's not what the intention was at all so that was a nice surprise that came from this chart okay and i'm trying to think i think the um going to the ninth house uh you know the ninth house being about classes and teaching and education what's interesting is i love that the mc is sextile to the moon and i love that uranus is sextile to venus so we had that nice sextile between the ninth and the 11th house, which I think just solidified the, the warm, cozy feeling of being at home within this group. Uh, but also I will say Uranus in the ninth house, I think I really had to change as a facilitator, as a teacher to step up to the calling of leading this group. Um, I have control freak tendencies hence why electional astrology comes very naturally to me. <laughs> so with my control freak tendencies, um, I think that I really had to look that in the eye. And there were times when I felt like I really had to check myself as the facilitator. And I was like, Mallory, like you cannot over you you cannot overdrive this class because the magic happens when you let go and you actually stop gripping the wheel of facilitation and teaching so hard and i really had to let go and i just had to let the class become what it wanted to become and i think that was actually the magic of uranus in the ninth house so I don't know, guys, it, it was it was a beautiful class. I, I loved this class. I probably will teach it again next summer. But part of me is like, I don't know if I'll ever have another class like this because it was just it was so good. And I loved them so much. And we're going to. Um, oh, that's the other thing. We're going to have a reunion. We're trying. I'm trying to plan some class reunions every month or so. So maybe the. <laughs> I kind of have this vision, maybe this is the Pisces moon in me, but I'm like, how fun would it be if like 20 years from now, this group was still meeting somehow? Um, and I, I think that's reflected in the chart. I think there is something about like, we're in this for life together. <laughs> like our, our the bond that we've created within this course is like 
very strong. And maybe that's the Cancer Moon in the 11th. Maybe that's the um, maybe that's the Jupiter on the descendant. But um, yeah, so I, I really do think the class is not it's over, but it's not necessarily over. And we will continue to meet as a group. So that was highly sensitive person summer camp, my election. Let's do, uh, just for funsies, let's just take a quick look at the class I'm teaching now. So this is my class that just started a week or so ago. Um, we It is a September tarot class. It's my tarot for self-discovery class. We started on September 9th at 6 p.m. with a Aquarius rising. And you can see um, I have Jupiter in Aquarius conjunct the ascendant. So I'm actually not sure how that is going to show up because if you recall in the highly sensitive person summer camp thing that I just showed you, remember that Jupiter was conjunct the descendant and that cultivated a very close group dynamic. But Jupiter on the ascendant, <laughs> I'm not sure what this will what will come up from this. I'm not sure if like us as individuals are really going to expand. Maybe it's less of a group dynamic and more of an individual kind of personal evolution. I do call the class tarot for self-discovery for a reason. I do believe that you know, my students, it's Tarot 101, but a lot deeper. And I do believe that my students walk away from this class really learning more about themselves and how to use self, how to use Tarot as sort of a self-nurturing, self-discovery, personal transformation kind of tool. That's how I like to teach Tarot. So that Jupiter on the Ascendant, I'm excited to see if that will kind of facilitate my goal of teaching tarot, which is a lot more than just having my students memorize cookbook definitions of the cards. It's a lot more about developing a relationship with the tarot. And also this Jupiter on the Ascendant is ruling the MC of this class. So fingers crossed that will be a good omen. Um, we can see here maybe the, the downside of this class, we have Saturn in the first house and Saturn rules the ascendant. So Saturn is technically ruling this class, but I'm not, I, I, I don't mind Saturn. I mean, maybe that's because I have a day chart and I have Saturn conjunct my sun. So Saturn is very rarely like a deal breaker for me. And we still have a day chart. So remember in elections, Saturn can ends up being probably a little bit more um, productive after a while in a day chart. Um, and I remember when I tweeted this chart, <laughs> someone, I forget who, um, but someone commented, oh, Saturn in the first house, maybe the class is going to have a slow start. And I was like, huh, that's kind of insightful. And to be honest, it kind of did. Usually my classes, um, I don't want to say they fill up fast, like, but they do, I feel like I, I have a certain number of spots because I like to teach live and I like to keep the class relatively small because I want to get to know each of my students and um, so usually it's not that hard to fill, you know, a class of 10 to 15 tarot students, right? So usually they trickle in, not right off the blue, but usually they trickle in pretty quickly. And I would say this class, I had a harder time filling it up until the end. And in the end, a lot more people just trickled in. So I'm not sure if that is <laughs> the Saturn in the first house, like the slow start to the class, but, um, but we're still here and we're still, we're still teaching the class. And the star of the show, I think for this chart is actually the ninth house. And we have Mercury, the moon and Venus all in Libra in the ninth house. And I'm also very interested to see how this shows up in class because um, Libra is my fourth house and I don't have a lot of air in my chart. Actually, that would probably be the element that is lacking in my chart, you could say. So, um, but this is a very 
air sign kind of chart, like, I don't know. So I think those, those air sign kind of um, qualities like communication and intellect and quickness, <laughs> quickness of the mind, quickness of thought, uh, sort of uh, may, may come into this class. And I am already seeing that show up even in the first class that we had last week. I, after class, I thought, wow, like this is a very intellectual group. This is a, a group, group that's very willing to talk. <laughs> and sometimes it's not always the case. It's not to say my other classes were not talkative or intellectual. I mean, I feel like all of my students are in some way, but they're kind of felt to be in this first class that everybody, um, it didn't feel like we needed much time to warm up. <laughs> and like I felt like we were all kind of already sharing our ideas and sharing our stories and really approaching tarot from maybe a little bit more of an academic lens so I did feel like that was how the Libra ninth house started to show up right off the bat I'm hoping that uh this moon in the ninth house the moon's approaching the uh Venus in the ninth house so I'm hoping that's gonna um be be good vibes for uh, as the class develops and as we form as a more solidified group and uh, also we have the moon in that trine with Jupiter so the moon is could we say it's enclosed by benefix mm, I don't know I don't tell me below is this moon enclosed by benefix if Jupiter is in retrograde. We could just say, we could say the moon is enclosed by benefics. <laughs> Let's just say that. Um, interestingly too, I'm, I'm interested to see how the themes of Vesta may show up in this class since Vesta is trining Jupiter. The one thing I'm nervous about is that we do have a Mercury retrograde in Libra um, during this course, but Mercury in this chart, I don't think Mercury is quite in its shadow. Mercury might be in its shadow. I, I'll have to double check, but at least Mercury is not near its stationing degree at any point, but we do know we'll have a Mercury retrograde in this chart at some point. So that's kind of the T on my current class. And I'll make sure to form or to make a kind of review video at the end of this fall Tarot for Self-Discovery class and let you know how that moon um, approaching the conjunction with Venus fully manifests. I would also love to sort of uh, uh, meditate a little bit more on what Saturn and Jupiter are really doing in the first house of this class. And um, yeah, so ultimately, I hope this helped someone kind of view the inner, my inner mind, my workings of how I was forming some of my course elections. And I have a couple other ele electional story times about different courses. So if you are a teacher and you're specifically looking to elect a time to start a course, um, my videos may be helpful. And um, as always, I would love to tag any other electional astrologer students, electional astrology students who are practicing electional astrology. Um, please, I'm, I'm going to tag you to make your own video. I would love to watch uh, electional astrology story time about anything that you elected and because uh, it helps me learn and let me know how you felt about my elections in the comments below and we'll i'll catch you guys in the next electional story time